Okay, welcome to Positivity Bias. We're on chapter 11, Positivity as a Choice. Um, interesting on, a note on that part that I wanted to share, uh, and I've talked about this book by Edith Ager, Dr. Edith Ager, um, called The Choice. And uh, she was a Holocaust survivor, and she talks about between uh, between um, Hang on a second. Let me get this right. Between stimulus and response, you make a choice mm -hmm. at all times. And the response you make is your choice. So choose wisely. And, and I think that's a, 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 a primary criteria to this whole concept of positivity bias. It's a choice. It's a choice we make how we respond to any given situation, any given circumstance. And you know we can we can choose to focus on all the, the the negativity, the challenges, the hard part, or we can choose to focus on the positive. In fact, we can choose to to search for and find the positive even in a given challenging situation. And I think that's one of the things we talk about in this in this chapter is is making that making that choice. And of course, we start off with a story about Rebbe Yitzchak of Berdichev. And we, we start off with Levi Yitzchak because he was known as the Ohev Yisrael, uh, a, a lover of the Jewish people. And he was always able to, to see the good in any given circumstance. And the story they talk about here is he comes across somebody who is um, he's smoking on Shabbos. And so Rabbi Levi Yitzchak speaks to him and he says, um, maybe you didn't realize it was Shabbos. And he says, no, I know it's Shabbos. He says, maybe uh, you forgot that you're not allowed to smoke on Shabbos. Maybe you didn't learn. Like, he says, no, I know you're not allowed to smoke on Shabbos. So the guy just basically, you know, shot down both of his chances at, uh, at redemption there, right? But Rabbi Levi Yitzchak, he turns his gaze towards heaven. He says, Rabbi Mishalolim, master of the world, who is like your people, Yisrael, Yisrael, the Jewish people. Even when I gave this Jew every opportunity to mitigate his offenses he refuses to do, do so where is such a scrupulous honesty to be found in the whole world so in other words he even found the good in the situation right it, it reminds me of a veteran there's a guy in california that i i've met and, and spoken with and a wonderful guy there and when he was a kid he was thrown out of one yeshiva after another so by the time he was like 10 or 11 years old, his mother was was beside herself. And she went into the Rebbe's office with this, dragging this kid with her. And, and she tells the, the Rebbe about all the challenges, all the problems with this kid. And, and, and he just doesn't listen. He doesn't behave. And she's at her wit's end. She just doesn't know what to do with him. And the Rebbe looks over at this little guy. And he says to him, he says, uh, are you a good boy? And he says, no. <laughs> he says, do you listen in school? No. Do you do you talk back? Do you listen to your mother? No. Mm -hmm. The Rebbe turns, the Rebbe turns to his mother, and the Rebbe smiles, this big smile, and he says, and I'll that Demis. He always tells the truth. That is the positive spin. <laughs> and it's funny because this guy tells tells a story later. His name is Sheldon, Sheldon Bear. His name is Sheldon Bear, and he tells a story that when he was um when he was drafted and he was heading off to Korea. So he went to the Rebbe's office to get the Rebbe's brachas. And the Rebbe gave him a pair of tefillin. And said, you know, do you, will you put on tefillin every day, except Shabbos and Yantav, will you put on tefillin every day, these tefillin? And he said, Rebbe, I have my own tefillin. I have my tefillin from my bar mitzvah. I have tefillin. And the Rebbe said, will you put on these tefillin every day you, when you're out? And he said, yes, okay, yes. He he went out to Korea. There was um, 
I don't remember all the details, but I, we are a recording is being developed. Uh, but Sheldon was in the midst of a, 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 ma a massive battle there uh, at what is now the the parallel the, the between the lines, and it was a horrible battle. Things were going on terrible, and his buddy next to him told him, "Put on your juice straps." And he said, we're busy. <laughs> we're crying out loud, right? And the guy said, put on your juice straps. The guy literally took a pistol to his head and cursed at him, put on your straps. So Sheldon put on his tefillin and he said, Shema. And everything quieted down and their particular battalion actually survived. Okay. It's a crazy story. So Sheldon, uh, this past summer, the summer of 2023, he went back to the parallel and I made connections for him with the, uh, the, the chaplain on the closest base that's there. And together they went out and Sheldon brought with him the tefillin and he put on the tefillin at the, what's the number of the parallel? It, 50th. 79th parallel? Isn't it the 37th parallel? 37th parallel? I forget the exact one, but but it's in his story. He'll tell we'll share it later. But bottom line is he went back there this past year and he put on to film in the same spot. It was a beautiful event. And they're making a video of uh, the whole story, making a videotape of it. Um 38th according to Google. Thank you, Eliron. 38th parallel. Irish close. <laughs> so the other story that's fascinating from Sheldon was that the tefillin that he he hasn't worn that pair of tefillin for 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 years um, because it had fallen in the mud out there in the you know in the midst of all the, the fighting and everything. It had fallen in the mud, it had been covered with mud, and so he you know he hasn't put it on for years, but recently he went and had his tefillin checked. His bar mitzvah tefillin were not kosher from the beginning. There was two errors in the bar mitzvah tefillin. They weren't even kosher to begin with. But the ones that he had checked that the Rebbe gave him, they are still pristine. The parchments are still pristine. Because typically, over time, there's cracking, there's fading, letters breaks. So that's normal. That's why we check our, you know, that's why we try and have our, our tefillin checked at least, uh, you know, uh, twice every seven years, right? But his were still pristine. So it's a crazy, crazy story. But again, focus on the positive. When he was a kid, the Rebbe, the Rebbe found a positive thing to say, even in the midst of all the, the turmoil. And Sheldon to this day says that was a turning point for him, that someone saw the positive in him and he started seeing it himself then after that. Hmm. You know, so it was... It, ta it, it takes the idea of someone pointing out our positive traits to help us focus on those things sometimes. Um, there's a, a beautiful story here about um, a little a little child, Tinook, a little kid in Brooklyn who he saw uh, a kapata. He thought it was his father. And he reached up and he, and he took the Rebbe's hand. He was walking down the Eastern Parkway and he, and he was holding the Rebbe's hand thinking that was his Rebbe. That was his father. You know, kids do that sometimes. They, you know, they miss, make the mistake. And at some point, he smeared his nose on the Rebbe's kapata, wiped his nose on the Rebbe's kapata. <laughs> and uh, his mother found out and was mortified and wrote to the Rebbe about how terrible she felt about, you know, her son's, you know, lack of respect. And the Rebbe's response to this, this mother was... Uh, on, on the contrary, uh, how he brought me great pleasure. One cannot begin to measure the heartfelt simplicity, innocence, and sincerity of a child if only half these qualities could be found in adults. So, you know, the kids closest was so moving to the Nebba that it, it was it was not at all, you know, the fact that the kid wiped his nose on the Nebba's coat <laughs> didn't bother him. It was a, it was a beautiful moment for the devil. 
right? So again, seeing, you know, the the beauty and the specialness in, in, the, in the moment, right? In the Jewish world, remember the story from Fiddler on the Roof? We have, uh, you know, the matchmaker, right? So the, so the matchmaker, uh, you know, trying to make the matches, right? So there's a, a funny story there. But when when parents are, are helping kids find the right match, right? So oftentimes there's this challenge of you're looking for the perfect thing right out, out of the gate, right? You're looking for the, this is your mate for life. You want to find the perfect person, right? So we have ideas in, of what we want uh, for our kids. And there was a family who, who was from a, a, a devout family with a lineage of, of Chabad family for generations. And that's what they were looking for. Someone else who's had Chabad generations, right? And yet the the Shidduch, the match that was being suggested was a Balchuva, someone who was, was not from a religious family, someone who had become religious. And they wrote into the family, wrote into the Rebbe, like, should we even consider, you know, considering our lineage, should we even consider this guy, right? And of course, the Rebbe's response was, would you have refused to take Abraham, our forefather, as your son-in-law? After all, his father Terach was a was an idol worshiper and even made work idols. So, would you consider that? So, obviously, now we would, right? But what the Rebbe is bringing out is that you you're writing off somebody who could have tremendous potential, like an Avraham Avinu, like an Abraham. And you could be writing him off because of his background? How do you do that? And so by making that comparison, the Rebbe is, is again, looking at the potential that's there, the goodness that's there. Obviously, to get where this guy is, he's already made huge life changes, right? He, he grew up in a not religious family. He became religious, so he's, he's changed the pattern. That in and of itself is an example of what this guy could accomplish. The fact that he's already made such major life changes when most of us just go along with whatever we're handed, right? How many college students today are getting out of college realizing that they're not in the field of their choice because they just went along with what mom and dad were suggesting? It's a chronic problem, right? And they're not happy. Here's a young man who who broke the, the the family tradition of not being religious, and he became religious. That's a huge show of his power, his strength. So of course you'd want to consider someone like this, right? But again, that's the choice we make with every stimulus before we respond. There's that chance to see, choose the good or just go with the easy route, right? to see the good part of it. And again, the, the next story from this chapter is a beautiful story about um, a Chabad rabbi who'd gone out to a community that was flailing, and he gave it a lot of kayak, a lot of strength, and he built it up. And, and now that the, the people have seen what's possible in the community, other religious organizations, other Jewish organizations are coming in. And he's like, it's like, uh, you know, now he's got all this competition, maybe he should move someplace else. And the Rebbe's response is, the competition proves you're doing great. The fact that you have competition means you proved it can be done, and others want to follow your, your path. They're chosen to, tra to follow after you. So that's a beautiful thing. It's a tremendous thing. So you should be very proud of all that you've done. And, and now up your ante, up your game, right? Now that you've got competition coming in, you, you, you've proven it can be done, you have to up your game. So again, finding there's a, a, a hidden point of goodness in every situation and, and find that and, and pursue those things, right? The, the positive opportunities there. Forum is coming up. There's a beautiful story about Forum in, in, in uh, Lubavitch World Headquarters, right? If you've never been to Lubavitch World Headquarters, you should know that it's different from many traditional synagogues. 
I remember growing up going to a, a reform temple where you had theater seating, everything was silent, and you were listening to the performance. And when I came to 770 back in 1980, the first time coming to 770, it's this huge open hall with iron coaches at the front. There are wooden benches, but the wooden benches are, are not attached. They can be moved because at some times everyone is facing forward for the services, but there are other times that the Rebbe is in the middle of the room up on a, on a, on a podium and on, all of the seating has to be rearranged for the Fabringen. So it, it, it's got this flexibility to be able to move and judge. But it's old wood. It's, it's you know, it may have a fresh load of paint on it for a couple of years. But, you know, people are, are, are walking over to get when it's really, really crowded. There's so many people there. People are literally stepping on the backs of the benches to get from one place to another. From where I grew up, I was appalled and how disrespectful people were being to a, a holy place. And I, I turned to, to my mentor, my teacher, and I asked about this. And he said, I think my, my internet was unstable for a bit there. I spoke with my mentor and he said, at home, you can put your feet up on the on the on the furniture. Right. <laughs> so he was pointing out that this is home. This is our home. And we're very comfortable here. You know, and, and it's not a place of of yes, there's a spiritual awe and sensitivity, but it's home and 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 we're comfortable here. So it's a very different environment. Um, when you go to the code of Jewish law. You know, there's a lot of things about how things have to be done. But, you know, even when the place was after for bringing and there's garbage all over the place because, you know, you're trying to feed a, a massive crowd while they're sitting at a for bringing and everything else. So it becomes a mess and people are cleaning up, but people lend a hand and it gets done. And there's a certain amount of respect for the for the fact of the synagogue. But but people are very comfortable. And in this search, the story here, it was Purim. And of course, in Purim, when the Megillah is being read, so every time the name of Haman is mentioned with a title, Haman HaRasha, Haman HaGigi, but every time it's mentioned with Haman with a title, so everyone makes noise. And of course, once little kids start making a lot of noise and having fun with it, it's hard to quiet them down. And so some of the, some of the older people in the synagogue were getting very frustrated at all the children's ongoing noise even well after Haman's name had been mentioned. And uh, the, the next Shabbos or later to Fabringen, the Rebbe mentioned uh, to the adults, he said, you know, in their innocence, the children were enjoying the spirit of Purim. And of course, you wanted to hear the reading of the Megillah. But we must also appreciate God's great joy at seeing the children celebrating. And I think there's a point to that of, of you know, there's a, there's a great point to the idea of, of, so they got exuberance. That's what kids do. That's a great thing. The fact is that they're here and they're celebrating Purim and they're invested in the holiday. That already is wonderful. It's fantastic. So you're a little discomforted by the, the noise and you have an obligation to hear every word of the Megillah. Okay, granted. But, but look at the great part of this as well. There was another occasion in 770 when, um, again, particularly the children trying to get from one place to another in the midst of a heavy crowd would, would walk on the backs of the benches to, to get someplace. But that was also sometimes where the, the extra, the books, the, the prayer books and, and, and the were the, the, um, <coughs> were stacked sometimes there and the kids are climbing over those, right? So yes, we have to have decorum but it's also beautiful to see that the kids feel at home in a synagogue. 
they want to come back, they love coming, that's a beautiful thing. And, and far more important than, than, you know, yes, holy books have to be respected and treated well, but the fact that kids love coming, that's that's even more important. So it's getting our priorities right, right? <laughs> The Rebbe was, had a custom to, during the weekdays, when it was time for Mincha prayer, the Rebbe would walk out of his office, walk through the hallway just outside the small synagogue, and right before you entered the small synagogue, uh, there was a pushka charity box mounted on the wall. And of course, the Rebbe would always give tzedakah before going to the afternoon service because he encouraged everyone to give tzedakah before our prayer because it opens up the channels of heaven. So oftentimes there would be a line of people there in the hallway watching the Rebbe come out of his office to go into to Mincha and a bunch of kids. And the Rebbe would hand out nickels to the kids so that they would then run ahead of the Rebbe, put the, put the, put the, 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 the nickel in the pushka, give to Dhaka. And so the Rebbe was encouraging children to give to Dhaka and kids love taking coins and putting in the pushka, right? And uh, in this particular case, it was Hanukkah, and the Rebbe was giving Hanukkah gelt. So the idea is that not only you should you know, give one to Tzedakah, but you should keep one, right? And he kept trying to give this little child, it was in his mother's arms, the Rebbe kept trying to give the child a coin, and the kid kept shying away. Because a little toddler, right? Kept shying away from the Rebbe. And, uh, and he wouldn't take the money. And the mother was embarrassed the couple was embarrassed because the, the kid was not accepting this, this gift of, uh, of uh, money from the Rebbe. And the Rebbe smiled and he said to the parents, it's a good sign. He's not someone who craves money. <laughs> so again, it's, it's how, do you, how do you take this reality of the situation and find the good, and 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 not only find it, not only see it, but call it out, mm -hmm. call it out, right? I was recently at a, a chaplain's conference at Olive Institute in uh, Bal Harbor, uh, Florida, and when Shabbos comes, it's a beautiful thing because you have all these military and in, in dress uniform in honor of Shabbos, and the the community there. They're so impressed, and they just love it, and it's a beautiful thing. One of our chaplains goes up to be the chazan, um, and beautiful chazan, beautiful, melodious voice, wonderful thing. And uh, But this particular time, there was a, a, um, a group of, of singers, four singers that had come for Shabbos, was also a bar mitzvah, and they were there to help entertain for the bar mitzvah. And so they went up while the, while the chazan is doing the evening service, and they went as a backup to the chazan, right? And so in my mind, I'm thinking most chazanim, there's a certain amount of ego involved in, in going up to the... No. <laughs> And, you know, a show. Maybe you're putting on a, a beautiful show, right? And and now there's four guys that are in, in, impeding on his show or kind of, you know, adding to it. Or But at the same time, right? So our chazan was, was beautiful. He's a chaplain. He's a chaplain. And he, and, and he was beautiful, but he... he he smiled and he graciously pulled them in and, and helped them be a part of the show, right? So he didn't take it as, as an impediment on his production, but he rather, he pulled them in and, and, and helped them really enjoy it. And to me, the 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 Avis Yisrael, the love that he had for these other people to pull them in and help them have a good time and and and, and you know enliven the song of the, the evening prayers uh, was a just a, a beautiful insight into his personality as well. You know what a what a wonderful beautiful personality he had. He 
you know, he could, had what could have been a, an awkward situation and he made it beautiful. He made everybody happy and it was just, it was a beautiful thing to watch. Um, I happen to be a fan of his, not, not only of his singing, but of, of he as a person. He is a wonderful, wonderful individual. Um, and um, yeah, it's a beautiful example on how to, to, to lift everyone's spirits, right? So our last story here was 1977, during Simcha's Torah, the Rebbe had a, a very serious heart attack. And the whole 770 cleared out immediately. The doctors came in. Uh, they, they treated him. He, didn't, he refused to go to the hospital. Uh, they treated him in his office. Uh, they brought in equipment to his office, etc. But that that first, it was on Shmini Atzeris. He suffered a serious heart attack. Two days later, he wanted to give a public speak. Wanted to publicly speak, right? And uh, because he, he'd spoken publicly for 38 years uh, on that occasion, he wanted to continue doing so. But at the same time, he just had a very serious heart attack. And the doctors were like, no, you can't. You can't put yourself out like that. So an agreement was was made that they would bring microphones into the Rebbe's office and, and the Rebbe would speak from the comfort of his office while the Hasidim would gather downstairs. Um, but the conversation with the doctor was the doctor insisting you must take care of your health. If you don't take care of you, if you're not careful, there's a 25% chance of relapse. Do you understand? And the Rebbe smiled and he said, yes. He said, you, you said that if I don't take care of my health, which I will, I assure you, I will. But if I don't do anything, I still have a 75% chance that this will never happen. <laughs> the same information, but focusing on the positive. Focusing on the positive. Same data, but focusing on the positive. And so that's that's the thing, is that, you know, changing our perspective to be optimistic uh, and problems will be revealed as potentials for growth, enemies as potential friends, um, teachers, setbacks can be seen as a springboard to the next level. All of these things are, are just seeing the reality for what it can be and could be, but focusing always, choosing, making a conscientious choice to focus on the positive, to look for the positive. So any positive shares from this week? Any idea uh, shares from this for your week of a situation that you made a conscientious choice to see the positive opportunity and not focus on what would easily could be focused on the negativity. I can think of one. <laughs> Go for it. Well, we had a state meeting on Sunday and they weren't very happy with the state commander. <laughs> so there were two guys sitting there with scowls on their faces and, and how unhappy they were. And I, quietly walked over to them and I said, why do you have a frown on your face? Well, you know, we're not da 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 And they expressed their dismay. And I said, well, you know, I attend this class with Rabbi Grossman every week called Positivity Bias. <laughs> and so that means that there's something positive in everything. And so if you look at the bright side, it should bring a smile to your face, not a scowl. And guess what? They smiled. <laughs> wow. Beautiful. Beautiful. So a simple reminder of the power of, of positive thinking can, mm -hmm. can change it. Beautiful. Thank you. Sweet. I did something between the classes today that in in reality seems like a futility, you know something not worth it but i did it anyways i went out and voted good for you <laughs> yes 
I, and it's it's important. It's important for many reasons. Um, none the least of which is that the power of of the Jewish vote as well. You know, as a collective, that's an important piece as well. So, um, good for you. Good for you. Who else has got a story to share? I know some folks that are going through some rough times with one of their son, with their son, and I'm inviting them to uh, to share a positive moment somewhere in the midst of all of the challenges. Okay, I will. Martin's been very, very um, silent and depressed, and. He is having a lot of trouble moving and he's having all kinds of spasms, which makes his body move, but not his having any control over how his body is moving. Um, when we brought him to the hospital, he could barely stand up and only with the help of a walker and not for very long. Um, one of the goals has been to find out what was going on and help him regain some of the muscle mass. Watching him eat at the hospital told me a whole lot of things. He's not eating any protein, which means his muscles are deteriorating. And um, because he's depressed and he's just lying there doing absolutely nothing. So I told him that he had to eat protein and the dietitian came in and gave him all kinds of bad advice because it was advice. <laughs> she gave him advice that was would have been good for a diabetic, but not good for a kidney failure diabetic because she was an intern and had, didn't have a clue. Right. So I was able to say, all right, forget everything she said. She's wrong. <laughs> Which made him laugh. <laughs> ah. <laughs> which is positive and i said um you know those protein bars that i keep shoving at you there's a reason for it and i explained the reason and i took out the book um oh what is it called uh you sent it to me um the body keeps the score yeah. and i read him some of the body keeps the score um he is going to be going to a rehab Place. not the one I wanted because the one I wanted doesn't have beds um but he's going to be going to a rehab um center for uh <coughs> doing, doing PT um daily PT one that can also do his peritoneal dialysis and it turns out there are only three in this mammoth area that can do both wow um and so it's not the one I wanted but it's one yeah. And he will be getting PT probably um, three times a day, whether he likes it or not. And yeah. that's what he really needs. So I read him a couple of passages from the book. Um, Martin is, um, what's it, when you, I, I'm tired, sorry. When you get the words, uh, the letters all mixed up. Right. Dyslexic. 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 He is dyslexic. So he doesn't like to read. So reading it to him is the only way to get him information. He's a very good listener when he wants to be. Anyway, it, it was a way to give him hope that things are not just going to get worse because they are going to get worse. Right. They definitely are going to get a lot worse. But if at least he can see that there is some improvement, he can hold on to that. And if he can get improvement and stay out of the hospital and stay not infected, he can get on the kidney list. He has now lost 160 pounds. Wow. wow. Over the last year, not quite a year. So, so the success now, in the story then is, the, is, is finding the ray of hope. Yes. And yes. focusing on the ray of hope. And humor. And humor, yes. Absolutely. Humor. Yeah. 
And so, it's funny because we have to find the humor that, that makes sense to each individual. Right. Because, you know, some people like slapstick. Other people don't like slapstick yet, you know. But that, but humor is a powerful medicine. Yes. Beautiful. And the Beautiful. interesting thing was there was a, a, a nurse's aide. Well, they, we used to call them nurse's aide. I guess they're techs or something like that now. Um, that was in doing his blood pressure and his his blood sugar and asked him how are you doing and he said um well i would be doing better if i had more control over the movements of my feet and she said well how would how would a foot massage work this is after she had listened to what i had said and mm -hmm. he said uh, I've never had one. And she, she said, that's okay. I've never given one. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm willing to try. But you have to promise me one thing, that you'll give me one too. Oh. <laughs> so they both laughed and decided neither of them knew what they were doing and decided it wasn't a good idea. But they laughed. And that's, a, that's the primary thing is a laugh. That's, that's Yeah, excellent. and she said when I saw her out in the hall, I didn't know whether I could joke with him or not, but you showed me I could. Beautiful. Yeah, you know, that's an important piece mm -hmm. is that in, in some very difficult, challenging situations, you you have to be sensitive to those things. I mean, I can't, you know, how many times have I been to a Shiva call, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes at a Shiva call, it's just not appropriate, right? Any type of humor at that time, right? But, but if the person sitting shiva makes a joke, or 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 someone else makes a joke and they laugh at the joke, you know, now you can read that as an opportunity, you know, that that not frivolous jokes, but you know, things that are appropriate at, 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 in a, in, a, in a context, right? Um, but humor is a, is a huge a huge thing, and being able to uh, to laugh at our at ourselves, laugh at our foibles. I mean, that's. I, I remember a bar mitzvah. So thirteen year old boys tend to be, you know, they're right there in that teenage, you know, and and this boy was in B'nai Ruvain in Chicago, big synagogue, big crowd, Shabbos morning, everyone's there, the place is packed, and while he's reading from the Torah. Of course, his voice cracks. Yeah. It's one of those things that every teenager is like, you know, mortified, right? He laughed and then continued. <laughs> I remember this 20 years later. It was beautiful. He laughed. He had enough self-esteem and self-composure to find the humor in the in the awkward moments <laughs> and go on and that's that's beautiful that's beautiful so yeah humor is a, a huge piece of it and and humor also sometimes can be the means by which we um acknowledge the awkwardness of a moment and then move forward so i'll share one last story before we wrap up tonight this was um this was a story I shared at my dad's funeral. We were visiting, we were a family of four, we were visiting Mesa Verde, yeah. which is with the, the old Pueblo houses up into the walls, right? So we're, we're visiting Mesa Verde. And I was like 14 years old, and my sister was just 16, just had her permit, begging mom and dad every opportunity to get a chance to drive <laughs> so that's the status we're we're kind of in right we go out to mesa verde and we're visiting the park we're touring around walking around and a ranger comes by and he tells us that there is a sniper loose in the park and has been shooting at people everyone needs to go straight back to the parking lot get in your car everyone on the floor except the driver Drivers stay low and, and get out of the park. Move, get out of here. So it's a very tense moment and we're quickly moving towards the park and it's kind of a frightening time. And uh, my dad takes the keys out of his pocket and he hands them towards my sister and says, you always wanted to practice driving, right? 
<laughs> and it broke the fear moment. It was so, <laughs> and he had this knack. Dad, God bless him, was an engineer. And for those of you who don't know engineers, they are typically quiet and thoughtful and they don't, they're not, they don't clown around too much. They're very serious people. But dad had a capacity to always crack a one liner that broke everyone in the room. And we'd like, like, what, what did that even come from? <laughs> so his capacity to break the stress in that moment, it was, it was a beautiful thing, a beautiful, beautiful thing. Before we go, do you want to tell the 